Let me begin by welcoming you, but by making a very important announcement that for those of you who did not have the opportunity to have something to eat, there will be uh, food outside. Um, welcome to all of you on behalf of my team at the Atlantic Council and our friends at the Bertelsmann Foundation, Tony Silverfeden and Sam George. Welcome to the launch of our roundtable for the report, Pacific Alliance 2.0, The Next Steps in Integration. A uh, huge word of thanks to Ambassador Ahn from South Korea, Ambassador Valdez of Chile, and Ramon Espinaza for joining us today here at this roundtable. For a long time, in the words of our friend Moises Naim, the Pacific Alliance was the most important alliance that nobody's ever heard of. Today, with over 42 observer countries around the world, lots of work, lots of commentary, lots of discussion on the alliance has truly grown. The alliance's potential is still insufficiently understood by citizens of the four countries, however. Interestingly, some of the best publicity recently for the alliance has come from recent comments of non-member countries, such as Brazil and Argentina, that have lauded the progress and the potential of the alliance. And indeed, this progress has fostered some excellent work, commentary, and discussion on its potential. Most of the discussion, however, has been generally focused on the short term, and not enough has been done to tackle what are the long-term challenges and the long-term potentials. So today, we launch a report that seeks to fill in that gap, the Alliance's potential to widen and deepen Integration in the Americas needs greater airing. Its friends need to push it to go higher and to move faster. And indeed, it is those changing winds in the Mercosur countries, namely in Argentina and Brazil, and their interest to engage with the alliance that convinces that now is the exact moment to think about the Pacific Alliance's agenda, not in the short term, but in the long term. So today, the paper that you have in your hands represents a year's worth of work in partnership between the Atlantic, the Atlantic Council and the Bertelsmann Foundation. And during this year, we have continuously asked ourselves one question over and over again, which is, what are the steps the Alliance must take to become a truly significant force for change in the region? We hope that this report will help inform and shape the upcoming presidential summit in Chile and that it will keep the momentum of the Alliance going. Last but not least, I want to thank the Bertelsmann Foundation for partnering with us on this initiative. Tony, I'd be grateful if you said a few words. Following Tony's remark, Sam George will do a presentation of the recommendations and the findings of the reports. Jason Marzak, uh, will, the co-author of this report, will then kick off the public part of the roundtable. Jason will introduce our panelists, Ambassador An, Ambassador Valdez, for a keynote conversation, and then we'll broaden the conversation with Ramon Espinaza. Please remember this conversation is on the record. If you're tweeting, make sure you use the hashtag ACPacificAlliance. And again, thank you all for being here today. With that, Tony, please. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I just want to begin with a note of thanks, uh, both to Peter and to Jason, not only for the wonderful partnership that you've had with us for the last year, but also for the warm hospitality. It, it's always the same when we come here, and we really do appreciate that. Thank you. Um, to Ambassadors Ahn and Valdez, thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor sitting on the panel with you. Uh, and to, to Mr. Espinosa, also a pleasure meeting you today, so thank you for being here. Um, I just want to say a word about the Bertelsmann Foundation because I realize that this is not the normal beat for the Bertelsmann Foundation on a day-to-day -day basis, so I might be a stranger to many of you. In fact, I think the people outside were a bit confused that I was here for the wrong event. Um, but I, I assure you I'm here for the right event, and I just want to say a word. Uh, the Bertelsmann Foundation is an independent and nonpartisan think tank. Uh, we're based in Germany, but we have a small office here in Washington, and we primarily focus on transatlantic relations. And I talk about trans transatlantic relations, I think we do it a little bit differently than, than many do. When it comes to transatlantic relations, we look at the broader European uh, relationship with the Americas, not just the US-EU relationship, but we go a bit broader than that. And it seems that we're not alone anymore. I was looking at the report and doing some additional research on the Pacific Alliance, and I see that about 15 EU members are observers of the Pacific Alliance. So I think a lot of people are beginning to think about the transatlantic relationship a little bit differently than maybe they once did. And I was also pleased to see that uh, the EU-Mexico 
uh, at least the next wave in the EU-Mexico trade discussions are opening. So uh, there's a lot of momentum here on the transatlantic, the broader transatlantic side, which I think is very positive. One of the reasons I really like coming to the Latin American events in particular is because it's a very different type of conversation than we have in Europe, uh, particularly when it comes to integration. When I go to events both here in Washington and in Europe, on a day-to-day -day basis, the debate usually vacillates somewhere between more Europe and less Europe. When we come here, it's always talking about smarter integration, which I think is a different conversation altogether, and it's a much more optimistic one. So for me, it's a pleasure to be here. I sit back and I listen, and I learn quite a bit from this group. So Peter, Jason, thank you again for having us. It's been a pleasure working with all of you. And I want to turn our attention now to Sam George, who's going to deliver a presentation on the publication that you all will receive today. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks so much, Tony, and, and absolutely thank you to the Atlantic Council. It's been a pleasure collaborating with them and their team over the course of the last year. We love talking about the Pacific Alliance. We very much enjoy it, and it's because it's a fundamentally optimistic project. And I think for those that work on Latin America, we hear all too often some of the trends that might not be going in the right direction in Latin America. So it's great to highlight the momentum of Chile, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru to highlight the economic dynamism, the macroeconomic stability, the democratic institution building, the dedication to trade and integration. If anything, I fear that we sometimes take this success for granted. I mean, since 2011, we can almost list off the major achievements, the 92% reduction on uh, tariffs of goods, uh, the fact that the member countries have integrated their national stock markets, the removal of inter-alliance visa restrictions, uh, we heard mention of the 42 countries across six continents that have signed on as observers. I mean, this is a fantastic start, but I think the reason we're here today is because what we've called the Pacific Pumas are interested in more than just a good start. And I think it's almost unfair that we'll, we'll refer to the Alliance achievements as low-hanging fruit, even though we do this in the paper. I mean, this is achievements that we see even the United States and Europe are having trouble reaching. And it's an early success that has positioned the quartet to achieve deeper and potentially more rewarding levels of integration. In other words, even better fruit is within reach. The question is just how to pick it. So that's what we've been working on. This is our idea. This is our concept of a Pacific Alliance version 2.0. And uh, as we've heard, we gathered experts and distilled the analysis and had the bilateral meetings. And we basically boiled it down into four sections of uh, finance, trade, energy and international affairs. And I'll let you know in advance, I'm not going to sit here and read the whole study. We want to move as quickly as possible to the discussion uh, portion of the event. But I just want to highlight some of our key findings uh, and maybe set the table for the conversation. One of the first topics that we circled was financial integration. And I think it's almost a, a misconception that the Pacific Alliance is a free trade deal. I mean, that's partially true. But this is about more than trade. And you know, there are definitely opportunities to deepen alliance trade ties with Mercosur, with ASEAN, with China. They exist. Uh, and we discussed that in the paper. But the truth is, for the moment, these four countries are not major trading, trading partners with each other. And some of the largest gains may actually be accessed through financial integration. Uh, a lot of people in this room probably know about MILA, the Mercado Integrado Latinoamericano. The, the alliance's shared stock market, and they were able to add Mexico on board in 2014, and with that, Mila now represents the largest stock market in Latin America in terms of capitalization with over a trillion dollars, and the second largest in terms of number of companies listed behind Bovespa in Brazil. Um, Mila has the potential to convert, you know, mostly overlooked and sometimes illiquid markets into one of global relevance. And so how do you get Mila rolling? Well, one step that we talk about is including fixed income sec securities, uh, especially government bonds, on the market. Uh, this still accounts for the bulk of transactions in the region, and listing them would represent a jolt of liquidity. But here is one of the more interesting things for me personally about this research and these conversations. Mila is just one aspect of potential financial integration. In our study, we outline cross-border infrastructure investment, pension fund integration, and the removal of inter-alliance capital controls as examples of other strategies uh, for midterm and long-term growth. The second of the two points I'm going to mention is energy. And this is where we're looking for next horizons. What are the next levels, the new things that the Pacific Alliance could potentially take on? Because energy is not 
currently part of the alliance remit, but in an era of ultra-low oil prices, the Pacific Alliance has the opportunity to rethink how it fulfills its energy needs, and in some cases, how to leverage its energy surpluses. And the, the thing is, the countries are doing this. Right now, the countries are doing this, but they're doing it unilaterally. We see hydrocarbon-rich Mexico continues its ambitious energy reform. Chile, a country that perpetually faces energy scarcity, is working to unify its multiple electricity systems. Colombia and Peru, meanwhile, are starting to fully ex uh, realize the extent of their hydrocarbon reserves, and they need to decide how to best leverage that in this era of low oil prices. We argue that this is great conditions to pursue a more integrated approach to energy, uh, specific, uh, especially given the breakthrough in U.S. and Mexican gas uh, markets. And specifically here, we're talking about pursuing interconnection of electricity grids, the establishment of common markets, the harmonization of energy policy, especially in, in terms of subsidies that right now are draining public coffers. Uh, but this requires real investment, and it needs to move beyond public funding. Uh, for this to work, the private sector would need to step to the plate, but so far business has been uh, relatively disengaged from potential cross-border energy projects on the alliance. So part of that's going to be uh, getting the private sector on board. Part of it will be creating the right incentives to pique the uh, private sector interest. And the final uh, section I would like to touch on from this paper is Pacific Alliance and international relations. And here we're looking at the alliance's potential as a regional player, but also at this point as a global player. I mean, the Pacific Alliance is no longer just a role model for smaller market-oriented Latin American countries, though that is important. Increasingly, this is a potential partner for Mercosur, and I think that the Atlantic Council and the Bertelsmann Foundation agrees that we're seeing potential shifts in the direction of Mercosur, uh, sp specifically on Mercosur's disposition to trade. You see Uruguay is a member of the Pacific Alliance, Paraguay, member of the Pacific Alliance. Argentine President Mauricio Macri has expressed interest with working with the alliance, and Brazil's uh, private sector is generally anxious for the same. But one particular area of untapped potential that caught our interest uh, was what to do with these member countries. I mean, again, this is a fantastic coalition, 42 countries, uh, very, very different and disparate countries, such as India, Trinidad, Switzerland. It can almost seem, though, that the alliance lacks a definitive plan for just what an observer country can contribute. It's like a startup that perhaps uh, wasn't expecting such immediate success and suddenly has all these people on board and needs a plan to scale up. And part of the problem is it can seem right now that it's this sort of pot of countries that have come on for different reasons. And when they meet, it's all hands on deck, even though South Korea may be interested in certain aspects of the Pacific Alliance, while Guatemala may be interested in other aspects. So in the paper, we look at strategies for differentiating observers. You know, some observers for geopolitical reasons. Others are interested in trade and commerce. The United States, very interested in issues related to technology, education, and entrepreneurship. So we're basically looking for a more nuanced approach or ways to pursue a more nuanced approach with observers. So those are some of the strategies that are outlined here and discussed in greater depth in, in the study. Uh, they're not easy. They require time, money, patience, and three things that are in short order basically all over the world right now. And in the end, they're policies that shouldn't nor couldn't be fleshed out in Washington or Miami. Ultimately, it will be up to the governments, the private sectors, and the citizens of Chile, Colombia, and Mexico, and Peru to decide that this is really something they want to get behind and, and push forward. But just as we wrote two years ago about the Pacific Pumas, the alliance is really about advancements and opportunities. And since then, the advancements have continued, and thus the opportunities are greater. This paper is about brainstorming the blueprint for taking advantage of those opportunities. So we hope you uh, check it out in your leisure. And right now I'd like to pass it over to Jason. Th thanks, thanks, Sam. And again, thanks, thanks to you, Sam, for a great partnership over the last year. And Tony, more, specific, more broadly with the, with the Burlesman Foundation, this has been a great, great effort over the, the course of the last year. Um, so we're going we're gonna to do the rest of this event a little bit differently. You, you might see that you're all, rather than theater style, you're all seated around a round table, which means uh, that it's not just a great 
free lunch of, of empanadas and arepas, but we want to bring all of you into the conversation uh, uh, as well. Um, we've, you know, as Sam mentioned, we, we had, a, we had a, a series of meetings over the course of the last year to inform this report. Um, some of the participants in the, are, are mentioned the acknowledgments. Uh, Ambassador Ahn, Ambassador Valdez, Ramon are just th are three of the many folks who have come together over the course of the last year to help to, uh, to inform this paper. Let me briefly introduce each of, of our, what we're gonna do is I'll start with a keynote conversation with the two ambassadors and then we'll bring Ramon in. But let me start with a, with a introduction. Um, ambassador An is, uh, was appointed ambassador of the Republic of Korea uh, by President Park in May of 2013. So you're on your three year uh, anniversary here. Um, he uh, beforehand recently served as first vice minister of foreign affairs and trade. And prior to that served as ambassador of the Republic of Korea to the kingdom of Belgium and to the European Union. And Ambassador, this is not in your in your bio, but I just learned that the ambassador is also an expert in and how the in, in, how the potato became so important <laughs> in Peru as well. So if you have any questions about that during the Q and A, a little bit off topic, uh, but he he's also very knowledgeable on, on that as well. Um, ambassador Valdez, to my left, has been the ambassador to, to the U.S. since May of 2014 as well. So you're uh, I'm pro to approaching your, your, your two year or at your two year mark. Uh, Ambassador Valdez is a great friend of the, um, of the Arsh, uh, Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. It's actually his second time in our house already this, this week. So um, that's great to, great to have you back. He boasts extensive history of diplomatic postings, serving as Minister of Foreign Affairs, as well as Ambassador for Chile, uh, as Ambassador for Chile to Spain, Argentina, and to the United Nations. He also served as Chile's permanent representative before the UN from 2000 to 2003. Um, uh, during which time Chile was a non permanent member of the UN Security Council and was also uh, deeply involved in the, uh, and, and maybe this brings back a difficult member, but deeply involved in the uh, US-Chile uh, trade negotiations as, as well. So uh, comes out with that uh, history. And then to the ambassadors left after the keynote conversation, we'll bring in Ramon Espinosa. Uh, Ramon is the lead oil and gas specialist at the energy division of the Inter-American uh, Development Bank. And before joining the IDB, Ramon worked at the uh, Venezuelan uh, state oil company, PDVSA, uh, where he was chief economist. Um, so again, um, uh, uh, Venezuela is not part of the Pacific Alliance, but I guess uh, maybe, maybe at some point, maybe at some point, right? Um, so we're gonna generate, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start, we'll have a conversation on what can be done to advance the Pacific Alliance's integration agenda. How can the de block deepen energy, trade, and finance ties? Three of the themes that we highlight and Sam mentioned during his presentation as part of this report. And then also with 42 observer countries across six continents, how can the Alliance fully maximize its global reach? And I'm just absolutely thrilled, uh, uh, Ambassador, on the, that you're here and that you participate in these discussions because you know, I think oftentimes we look at the Pacific, Pacific Alliance for other issues in Latin America and we think of them through this narrow lens of, of Latin America. And the Pacific, Pacific Alliance really uh, does it, you know, with 42 observer countries, with South Korea as part of that, uh, really tries to, um, has a really great potential opportunity to broaden that conversation. Um, you know, and for you, you know, distance has really, you know, not been an obstacle for South Korea to get involved in the region. Um, I guess the, the, there's a trade agreement with Colombia, which will likely enter into force this year. From your perspective, what does what does South Korea see in, in, in Latin America as potential opportunities? Well, first of all, can you hear me well? Well, yes. I hope you do. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your kind invitation. Then I just look around the room and I tell myself, maybe more than half of you would be speaking Spanish, right? <laughs> I don't, I don't. But at the same time, it didn't stop you from inviting me, so thank you so much. And then I have to tell you, this is my Chilean day. Why, why do I say that? It's because I'm carrying a pin and this pin, in fact, stands for one of the highest honor, which is bestowed. The highest honor bestowed by the government of Chile, which is Bernard O'Higgins, Order of Bernard O'Higgins. So that is the reason why I say this is my Chilean day, day of Chile for me. Well, Jason, with respect to your real question, what we see, what uh, Korea is one of the more than 40 observer countries for Pacific Alliance. And then what we see in Latin American countries, or well, more specifically, uh, Pacific Alliance countries. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, last time when I came here, then I said the Pacific Ocean, for us, is not an ocean, it's a small lake. That's what I said last time. And then, and then as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why I say that is because of what I'm going to tell you, which is that what do we see 
in member countries of the Pacific Alliance, we see like-minded believers in the same set of beliefs. We see like-minded practitioners on the same set of beliefs. And then what I mean by the same set of beliefs? What I mean by the same set of beliefs is liberal world order. Liberal world order. And then, of course, there are many important pillars in, that, in the liberal world order. The, order the, the pillar of security, starting from United Nations Security Council, and then there would be a pillar of economy, starting from Bretton Woods system, WTO, and then many, many arrangements, including Pacific Alliance and other FTAs. And then there would be another pillar, which I would call the values underlying liberal, liberal world order, which in fact would include such concepts like human rights, democracy, transparency. In my mind, there are many important pillars which support this liberal world order. And then, as a matter of fact, they, in fact, most of these in institutions I was telling you about, they, in fact, came into, this wo in into, into the international community after World War II. And then, in my mind, it has served, this liberal world order has served the international community very, very, very well. And then one example would be the fact that after World War II, there have been a large number of military conflicts, but at the same time, none of them was fought among major powers of the world. So relatively speaking, it has been a very peaceful world. Talking about economy, then I think we have experienced unprecedented economic growth, and then as a matter of fact, more balanced sharing of fruits of, of that economic growth after World War II. In comparison with all the pre preceding hundreds and thousands of years, in fact, the economic growth as well as distribution of that economic growth, in fact, it has been unprecedented. And spread of democracy, spread of human rights, that, in fact, is what we experienced over the past seven decades. And then in my mind, none of it would have been possible without this liberal world order. Look around the world, looking around the world, there are, there are a large number of countries well, United Nations member countries, there, there are more than 193 of them. And then, well, as a matter of fact, in my mind, they, each and every one of them, are beneficiaries of this liberal world order. But at the same time, their attachment, their support of liberal world order, that's not the same. Some of them appreciate more highly, some of them do not do so. But at the same time, when I look at countries like Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico, I think this is something we share, something we share between Korea on the one hand and all those countries uh, which we find across the small pond which we call Pacific Ocean. In fact, we share those beliefs and not only sharing it, we practice those values. And then that is, the, that is what we see, what I see in those countries, I mean member countries of uh, Pacific Alliance. And Sam has just talked about several different areas where the, this study has focused upon. There is financial integration, and then energy, and then international relations. And then, of course, each and every one of them are very important. But at the same time, I think, so far as Korea is concerned, this international relations aspect of it, I think this is something which counts very, very important <coughs> so far as Korea is concerned, and then, and then uh, that's something upon which we, are, we yeah. wish to build our yeah. relations for. So, I spoke for too long. No, 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 no <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. I mean, I think ab above all is that this, the shared values that, so that South Korea sees with the Pacific Alliance countries that supersedes all, all the, the, the intricacies within it. Ambassador Valdez, there are you know, 42, as, as, the, uh, as the ambassador has mentioned, 42 observers uh, uh, with a number of uh, observer countries actually represented around, around this table here. From your perspective, how can the alliance better maximize the ties it established with countries like South Korea that, that see this real uh, uh, share of val sharing of values uh, with, with, with Chile and with the broader Pacific Alliance? What, what, what more can be done to, to maximize the, the ties that are already nascently existing? Well, <clears throat> let me say first that uh, I, I want to thank the Atlantic Council for this opportunity once again to discuss the issue of the uh, Pacific Alliance and the Asian countries. I fully agree with everything that Ambassador Han has said, and I think it is very important what he has said because uh, these are the basis over which we have built 
what we are building, not only in terms of the Pacific Alliance, but also in terms of our relationship with Asia, in the ASEAN, ASEAN countries. Chile is uh, probably the best uh, example uh, uh, for, 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 as a, as a, in, in, in a celebration of what we have done. We are normally faced to such an amount of disasters and mistakes in the international scene that it is good to be reunite ourselves to speak and to debate about something that is working and something that has a positive and optimistic future. And here we are talking about something that it is not simply an hypothesis. It is something that we have done during the last 20 years. Chile became involved with APEC at the beginning of its democratic return. It was in 1990. In 1990, 1990, 1991, that 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 that, that Mr. Foxley, the Minister of uh, uh, Finances at the time, decided that uh, it was an important thing for Chile to join uh, APEC, and uh, it was quite an effort to do that. And uh, since then, uh, we have increased enormously our trade with Asian countries. We have received an important uh, amount of investment. Our agreement uh, signed in 2004 with Co South Korea has been extremely successful. And uh, Chile discovered that uh, it was located in the Pacific Ocean and that uh, the Pacific Ocean was uh, the most important area in which our foreign policy could develop. Therefore, since the, we joined um, the APEC, we have uh, signed free trade agreements with countries like Australia, China, Hong Kong, Japan, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, and I already mentioned South Korea. We are currently negotiating FTAs with uh, Indonesia and the Philippines. And um, also since then, um, this, this, uh, this uh, relationship has proven enormously successful in terms not only, as I said, of multiplying our trade, but also uh, increasing our attraction of investments. Now, what, what can we do else? I believe, that, I believe that one of the things we have to do, and as you know, Chile will assume the presidency of the uh, Alliance of the Pacific next July, is to involve, is to develop a better and closer relationship among the members of the Latin American members of the Pacific Alliance. I think that our relationship with the Asian countries would benefit from countries that are more integrated in our own region, which are capable not only of integrating their financial services and their financial systems, but also increase their trade among them and the develop our infrastru infrastructure, which is absolutely essential for the uh, uh, integration with the Pacific region. Therefore, the, this is a first point which I think should be underlined, this uh, necess necessity of increasing the amount of trade and integration between ourselves in the region is important not only by its, in itself, but it is extremely important in our relationship with the Asian uh, partners. Um, I believe that, that uh, in that sense, uh, probably a second thing which we are planning to do with our presidency from July onwards is to include uh, into the alliance and into the participation in the decision making at the alliance, the middle and small businesses. Because the participation of middle and small businesses gives a completely new dimension to what uh, the Pacific Alliance has been doing and, what, and, and, and to the exchange we have with the Asian countries. Therefore, um, one of the enormous advantages of, of this endeavor is that uh, we are just beginning, and I will come back once again to what Ambassador Han was saying. We are, we are just beginning, but we are building this alliance and this policy towards the Pacific on very strong basis. Very strong ideological basis, very strong uh, basis in terms of beliefs, uh, as he said, on a, uh, an, 
uh, an open societies which can work not only in terms of open trade, uh, attraction to foreign investment, uh, rule of law, which is absolutely basic, uh, the respect for human rights and democracy. These bases are the only basis over which we can build this uh, alliance to become really uh, uh, the most important partnership probably in this world of the 21st and, century. And Ambassador, beside, you, mentioned, you mentioned trade investment as being the primary vehicles, I think, to, to drive that integration with, with Asian partners like South Korea. Are there other areas? I mean, the Pacific Alliance goes much, is much broader than trade and investment in which, in which th course. those ties can, th course. there's a real opportunity to maximize those ties like no other commercial agreement really allows for. Well, I would say that um, cooperation in areas like science and technology, cooperation in uh, areas like education are absolutely basic. Our students, have begun to learn some of the Asian countries' language, but this is a very limited progress up to now. And we need them to make a much bigger effort to uh, increase this exchange of people in among the uh, two uh, areas of the Pacific. I think that um, the harmonization of rules and all the other elements which are important, facilitation of trade, um, government procurement, the new disciplines that in, are incorporated into F FTAs, uh, we need to discuss that. And I believe that the meetings that have taken place recently, um, recently between members of ASEAN and the Pacific Alliance, and uh, the discussion they have on areas such as energy, minerals, trade facilitation, innovation, logistics, infrastructure, and small and medium enterprises. These, dis these discussions show that we are perfectly aware of the horizons we have in ahead of us. And I, uh, I think that's the response yeah, so there's to a, there's question. A, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of opportunity. Some of that already tapped, but a lot of that opportunity. I'm back. Now, Ambassador, before going back to you, I need to make a very important announcement that there's more food outside. Uh -huh. So if you didn't have empanadas, if you didn't have arepas, please feel free. We, we won't be offended if you get up from the table and walk out and, and have some food and come but back. But not for the participants. Uh -huh. uh, or bring some back for the speakers <laughs> as well. Now. Now, Ambassador, on, Ambassador Valdez mentions a few different areas in which he thinks there could be greater cooperation uh, uh, with South Korea and with the many Asian observer states, trade investment, um, education, technology. From your perspective, uh, how can the Pacific, uh, do you agree and, 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 and feel free to agree or, or, or build on that? And then also, how can the Pacific Alliance, from your perspective, better integrate the Asian observer states going forward? I think one real you know, question that, that's out there is, you know, if there isn't, you know, uh, really kind of a maximization of the uh, of the role and, and that observer states have, will, will they eventually become tired of becoming an observer state? Right? How do you, how do you kind of continue that that momentum and that excitement to be a part of, of, of the Pacific Alliance? Right. Well, with respect to what I think about uh, what I think about what uh, we just heard from Ambassador Valdez, and of course I wholeheartedly support and and agree with everything that has been stated by Ambassador Valdez, but in particular. I was quite struck about the fact that Chile joined APEC in 1991. And then the reason why I was so impressed about that was because 1991, Korea was the presidency of APEC. Good. So in other words, we, <laughs> right. in fact, played certain role mm. in admitting Chile to the sure. APEC process. Right. Sure. So, so, so that's something what, which was very impressive to me. But at the same time, his emphasis, I mean, Ambassador Valdez's emphasis on small and medium enterprise, I think it is enormously important. Why? Because why do we, do we engage ourselves in economic activities? It is in order to create jobs. And then look at big enterprises. And let's, let's look at small and medium enterprises. But given amount of capital, which in fact is invested in big enterprises, and the same amount of capital which is invested in small and medium enterprises, which, in fact, option would lead to a large number of jobs? The answer was obvious, small and medium enterprise. And that, in fact, is the reason why we must not forget about small and medium enterprise. That, in fact, is the, is, is, is the economic aspect of the question. There is another important question we should be looking at, which is the social aspect of the question, which is, well, this is something which became uh, 
widely circulated in the international e economic circle, which is this distinction between 1% and 99% Occupy Wall Street movement. That, in fact, is something we have been hearing from 2011. And then, as a matter of fact, it was the social movement at the time. But by now, after four years, after five years, what we are experiencing in Europe, what we are experiencing in, in the United States, it is now it is more than social movement. Now it is economic movement. And now it is even political movement. So that, in fact, is something or reality we have to deal with. And then I think this emphasis on small and medium enterprise, it, in fact, could be a good antidote to this problem being created mm -hmm. uh, out, of, out of this 1% versus 99%. That, in fact, uh, so th those are two different aspects of uh, the, the reason why we should be focusing more upon small and medium enterprises, economic impact as well as social and political impact. And but the, the, oh, please go ahead. Hmm. I said the the, 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 the uh, private sector, small and medium sized business, this is something that we, we talked about as part of, the, as part of our roundtables, right? The importance of, of involving private sector participation uh, into the Pacific Alliance so that it's not seen as a, as, micro, as merely as a government driven initiative, but it's really an initiative that's really benefiting, benefiting the, the, the people. Um, I want to make sure to bring Ramon into the discussion and, and, uh, and, and on the topic of, of energy as well. Um, this is something that's obviously critical for small and medium-sized businesses, getting, getting energy right. It's critical for trade. It's critical for investment um, and for the, uh, the broader um, uh, outreach with, with observer states. So remote energy, what is, energy is, is, is not a, a, a priority in the agenda for the Pacific Alliance, um, but we think it should be. Uh, so that's why we included our report, included our discussions. What is, what's preventing the Pacific Alliance from adding energy into the mix of its issues? Of course, there are the geographic divisions, geographical divisions with Mexico, but, but beyond that, what's, what's preventing it and what are some low-hanging fruit potentially to involve uh, uh, energy as part of these discussions? Uh, to talk about energy, uh, first of all, <laughs> I have to thank you both, uh, Jason and Peter, for your kind in invitation and the, the council. I'm really honored, and, I'm, and I mean it to be in this uh, panel. To talk about energy integration, I'll start talking about uh, mining. Uh, needless to say that the comparative advantage of Latin America and the Caribbean as a continent, it's uh, are their endowments of uh, minerals, uh, energy, and fertile lands. Uh, exports of mining and energy are the first source of uh, foreign exchange for the Latin American countries as a whole. And it is particularly the case of uh, Chile, Peru, and, and, and Colombia. Uh, and the super cycle we saw, we witnessed between early 2000s and 2011, uh, in the case of uh, Latin America was very much fueled by exports of, of these uh, raw materials. Trade, Trans-Pacific trade of minerals increased 10% per year on average between 2000 and 2013. And Trans-Pacific trade uh, in 2013 was in the order of $33 billion just for minerals. Chile is the first supplier to the Asian countries of copper and molybdenum. And Peru is among the first in copper, lead, and zinc. Uh, China's investment in the direct foreign investment in the extractive sector in Latin America went up 25-fold uh, uh, between 05 and 14, from 4 to 110 billion uh, dollars. Then, given the importance of mining exports for uh, Peru and Chile in particular, I want to relate that to uh, energy. To produce copper, you need plenty of energy and water. Uh, copper is produced in southern Peru and northern Chile, and those are desertic areas. They are thirsty, literally thirsty, of water and energy. And to provide water, you need plenty of energy. You have to desalinize the Desalize, water yep. and pump it up. Uh, these uh, very high mountains. Uh, on average, it's like 200 kilometers uh, in length and 2,500 meters in altitude. Then that requires 
not just the desalination process requires plenty of energy, it's very energy intensive, but you requ require plenty of energy to take the water up the mountains where the mines are. Then this region, it's uh, energy thirsty, southern Peru and northern Chile. Northern Chile is, is by far a net importer of, of energy. Then there, there is a case for international trade that brings down the requirement for, for energy. The northern side of the, and, of the Andean countries, I mean Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and northern Peru are energy, energy rich. It's, uh, they have hydro and gas to generate electricity. Then there is a huge potential of energy integration uh, uh, along the Andes south to supply the mining sector, but also the requirements of the countries uh, as, as, as a whole. When you export copper, you are exporting essentially or a good deal of energy. Then without energy, you cannot produce uh, copper. Peru is building this uh, El Gasoducto del Sur, the southern, uh, the southern uh, gas pipeline to supply the minings, uh, uh, mines in the south of, of Peru. Then comes the f my first answer to your question. Uh, Chile and Peru do not trade energy, and I believe that's for historical reasons. Mm -hmm. There is a huge potential, and uh, I'm pretty certain that a good deal of the liquefied natural gas that Peru exports ends up in Chile with a different flag <laughs> as providing from other uh, regions. But once Peru has finished the pipeline to the south uh, to supply energy to its mines, it, there will be a huge potential for exporting either gas by pipeline, which would be much more efficient, or electricity to northern Chile to foster the mining sector in, in the northern part of, of, of Chile. Thanks, so I'd like, Ambassador Valdez, I'd like to get your, maybe your, your thoughts on that. Is there, is there a potential for this greater Chile-Peru energy cooperation? And then also, as Ramon saying, you know, energy is the, is the backbone uh, for any economy. And so, you know, from that perspective, what are some of the, maybe second question for you afterwards is what, what are some of the Pacific Alliance's most successful policies when it comes to um, trade and investment, but first, start off. Is this? Do you see this as a as a uh, as a potential uh, this greater cooperation? Of course, yes. Uh, the the southern part of, of of Latin America has countries like mine, which have very little resources, traditional resources in matters of energy. I have to mention that we have been doing enormous efforts during the last years to increase uh, the uh, importance of solar energy and wind energy and that, uh, uh, to give you just an idea, two days ago the President of Chile announced that our subway system in Santiago will be um, sustained by solar energy in 40 percent during the last years, the next years. Oh, that's impressive. Uh, that's very impressive, and it is the first case practically in the world. But it is not enough, and we have been exploring with Peru uh, different possibilities of uh, connecting this gas, as you were mentioning, and I believe that there are possibilities for this to happen, and it would be enormously important, I believe, for both countries to reach agreements on, on this, in this area. Uh, it is true that uh, the southern part of America has cases like ours and has cases like other countries which are literally floating in gas, but have had, we have had difficulties to ac accede to, it, to, mm -hmm. to, to that gas mm -hmm. because of different historical reasons which are not the case to discuss here. Now, one of the things we mentioned, we talk about the report, one of our recommendations, our trade section, is about the importance of uh, the Pacific Alliance for integrating global supply chains. And I'd love your perspective, then I'm going to come, come to you, Ambassador, on afterwards from, for your perspective on this. Um, but first, Ambassador Valdez, from your perspective, how, what, how can individual alliance members better integrate into, into, uh, into global supply chains? And probably energy is, is obviously part of, part, of that, part of that equation, but there are other things. We, we mentioned the report, um, regulatory harmonization, other things, creating backward linkages. But I'd love your perspective on what more can, can be done. 
Well, the first of all is harmonization of rules, because if we have different concepts of the way in which trade has to be conducted, therefore uh, the, the difficulties in connections and uh, associations are, en are enormous. And uh, therefore we have been trying to do that within our uh, small communities of members of the uh, Pacific Alliance. And let me say that it is much easier to say that than to do that. Therefore you need an enormous amount of political will in order to, um, anybody who has been a trade negotiator knows that it is extremely easy to stop uh, a negotiation with just one small detail uh, in a process in which when you look at it, then two years or three years later, you begin to wonder how it was possible that we had three, need for three years to solve that problem. Therefore, my impression is that there is an enormous need for political will in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile to use this period of time to make progress. Let me say, let me introduce an idea which I'm, was not in your mind when you posed the question, but which I think is extremely important. Please do. We are in a center uh, of thought, of reflection here, the Atlantic Council, and uh, we are reunited here, people and governments, that as the ambassador said before, we believe in this um, liberal world order. But we see enormous threats to this liberal world order. Uh, and we see a growing uh, mistrust against this liberal world order. And this mistrust is creating difficulties. And therefore, uh, countries that, for instance, have uh, subscribed the TPP, believing that the TPP is a good instrument and a good mechanism to make progress in this association between the Asia-Pacific countries, Latin America, the United States, etc., um, are facing a situation in which uh, these TPP is having serious problems to be approved, particularly in the country that launched the TPP in, its, in the first place. Second, uh, we are facing a sort of discourse against uh, free trade, which goes against our own experience. It is not a matter that we adhered at a certain point to an ideology. It is a matter that we began practicing uh, a, a way of integration into the world market that brought enormous advantages to our countries, to, its gro to their growth, to their capacity to distribute, and to, capa to our capacity to diminish and reduce poverty in our countries. Therefore, uh, when Chile assumes this responsibility in July, to lead uh, the work of the uh, Pacific Alliance, we believe that the Pacific Alliance should, makes, should make once again uh, a, a very strong statement confirming its uh, will to continue in a, pro, in its progress in free trade, attraction of foreign investments, and keeping open societies. I believe this is enormously important today. This is not simply mm -hmm. politics or rhetoric. We are facing really a threat against the type of principles that allowed us to come to these agreements. And I believe that would be a, an enormous support to also, the, the only way to support this and to prove that this is so is to increase the level of trade and connections we have among the countries of South Latin America that are working together in the Pacific. So th this, I mean, this, this is the moment, which I, th I think is an excellent point, but this is the moment to, to double down on That's what we've right. been talking exactly. about. Double down on the liberal world order, Ambassador Alma, you said to attract South Korea to the Pacific Alliance countries and, and Ambassador Valdez likewise. Uh, Ambassador, I love your reactions to, uh, to uh, Ambassador Valdez's uh, uh, comments about this is the moment to do that. And then also, from your perspective, what, 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 what else can individual alliance members do to better integrate into global supply chains, right? Because this is, this is critical, right? Involving small and medium-sized businesses, not just large corporations, and seeing the benefits of the Pacific Alliance is, is critical to realize the, the potential that trade really has. And so from your perspective as an alliance, as an alliance observer country, what more can be done to, to better integrate those, those supply chains? Well, as much as we often say, can you hear me? We often say global supply chain, but at the same time, let us just remember this, which is that if there should be a supply, there should be demand, right? 
there couldn't be supply without demand. So I think we should be trying to look at both sides of uh, the, the coin, I mean, how to increase and how to improve global supply chain. I think we should be looking at both ends, that is to say, uh, supply, ch supply side as well as uh, demand side. And then when it comes to supply side, then, of course, I listen to Ambassador Valdez, and then I agree with everything which has been stated by <laughs> Ambassador Valdez, of course. I mean, harmonization rules, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at the same time, I think one thing we were discussing last time when we were here, it was cumulative rules of origin. Mm -hmm. Cumulative rules of origin was something we were discussing about. And then in that, in that uh, context, I was wondering, uh, well, we have been talking about ASEAN practices. ASEAN mean, meaning Association of Southeast Asian Nations. We have been talking about ASEAN practices. And one ASEAN practice, I don't know if anybody has raised this issue in this group or not. One of the practices of ASEAN has is to have FTA collectively. That is to say ASEAN on the one hand and on, on other, on other, say, FTA member country. So it is ASEAN plus one country, right? Mm -hmm. So the first such collective FTA ASEAN entered into, it was between uh, China and ASEAN. Second FTA, su such type of uh, FTA they entered into, it was ASEAN plus Korea. So that's how they began to do it. Mm -hmm. ASEAN on the one hand, collectively, and then on other country. And then big advantage of uh, such an arrangement is cumulative rules of origin. Mm -hmm. That is to say, it is so easy to meet the requirement, the rules of origin, if you do it collectively. So that, I think, was the big, big, one big advantage of this kind of arrangement. I don't know if uh, Pacific Alliance has uh, practiced this, this kind of practice, but, uh, but that may be something uh, you may wish to look into. But at the same time, there is one caveat. And then the caveat is, uh, as I told you, uh, Korea is one of the country which has ASEAN, FTA with the ASEAN at large. And the problem we had to deal with at the time was something we often call uh, in the trading community, race to the bottom. Race to the bottom was something we had to deal with. That is to say, ASEAN, they were 10. And then they were negotiating with Korea. And then they had to come up with common negotiating ground. And then when ASEAN member countries were trying to come up with common negotiating ground, then if one member country had difficulty in one sector, then somehow it was that country which at the end of the day had a bit of power. So that, in fact, was something we had to deal with. So it took, uh, well, ra rather long period of uh, time for the negotiation. Mm -hmm. But even then, it was, it was worth trying. So it may be something you may uh, wish to look into, I mean, among Pacific Alliance countries uh, from, uh, say, uh, supply point of view. But at the same time, what I meant from the main point of view would be this, which is that unless you, in fact, improve your market access, not only institutionally, but also, but also practically, then, in fact, it will be difficult to significantly improve your status as a global supp supply chain. And then, what, in fact, could we do in order to improve the demand from other other side of the Pacific Ocean? Then I think there is no royal, royal road for that. The only way we could do that it would be through more exchange of uh, people mm -hmm. at the level of leaders, at the, at the level of business community, at the level of tourists, at the level of students. There's something which, in fact, we must be doing in order to uh, in order to significantly improve and yeah. enhance the demand yeah. on the other side of the Pacific. Without that, then it will be difficult. Yeah. And then in, the, in, in the context, I have to tell you, my president has been to, well, all those countries, Colombia, Peru, Chile. That was uh, last year in April. And then, in, and then uh, this year, no, November, I guess. And then this year, then my president has been to Mexico. So that's what my president that's did at the level of the leaders. Yeah, but critical. at the same time, I think it is enormously important to, in, in, in fact, improve exchange of uh, people at the level of business community, at the le level of students, et cetera, et cetera. And I strongly urge you to think about Korea as a country where your business community as well as students should be coming to. Coming to. Why do I say that? It's because I think it is not just the volume of trade we can develop. Uh, between Korea on the one hand and Pacific Alliance partner countries on the other side of the Pacific. But the thing is, 
Korean market has very peculiar importance. Why? Why do I say that? Because of two things. First of all, because it is considered as a very important testing bed, testing bed for your product. And then this is not something which I say. Uh, several weeks ago, I was up in uh, Philadelphia, no, Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and then I came to visit the headquarters of Procter & Gamble. Procter & Gamble, they were saying, our presence in Seoul is enormously important, not only because of what we sell in Korea, but because of the fact that it's a very important testing bed. Korean consumers, they, in fact, somehow it's not easy to satisfy them. So once we can satisfy them, then we can say to all the other possible. Now, now, Ambassador, I want to make sure to bring Ramon back in the conversation, and then I have another question for you. Sorry, since I you was to, talking already too long. Since you have to leave at 1.40, I want to go back to you another question. But what you mentioned here, uh, 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 accumulation of rules of origin, this is actually one of the recommendations uh, that we dis that, that came in, that is part of our report uh, for, for the uh, Pacific Alliance, as well as this working toward the free movement of people, goods, capital, and services. That That is also critical uh, for the Pacific Alliance. We talk about a little bit more, uh, Sam, that free movement insofar as the, the Pacific Alliance itself. I think what the you know, ambassador is saying is that this should be with observer countries as well. Now, Ramon, we, we're, I want to go back to, I want to shift a little bit to, to investment, right? Um, and, uh, and we're talking about coordination uh, of, of, um, uh, on, the, on the commercial front, but also there's a, a great need for uh, better coordination on the, on the energy front. And I'd like to ask, where, where do you see opportunities for greater regulatory coordination, which is, um, which is critical, which is oftentimes lacking, and, and how this could potentially attract more investment into, into energy products, uh, projects in the, in the alliance? There is already coordination between Colombia and Ecuador and Ecuador and Peru. What we need is uh, further coordination and eventually experts with trade between uh, um, Peru and, and Chile. And that would create a very large market and would give the economies of scale. But let me make a point in terms of uh, value chains and value added in the sector. A dream of the uh, raw material exporting countries is uh, diversification. And, and they, we always traditionally have understood diversification as moving away to other sectors where usually we, we, don't, we are not competitive. And, and, and it becomes a chimera, this diversification. What modern uh, economics has discovered is that the best way to diversify is diversify around the sectors where you have uh, a comparative advantage, adding national value to that, engineering goods and services produced in the country. Uh, the, the leading country in this process, again, is Chile. There is a, a strong alliance in Chile called uh, Valor Minero, that's a uh, mining value added. Uh, it, it, it is a public-private partnership. Actually, it was born in Fundacion Chile. And the government is in, the companies are in, the, the trade unions are in, and, and civil society is in. And one of their goals, they have many, but one of their goals is at present Chile is exporting $500 million per year of mining-related goods and services. Their, their goal is to increase that tenfold over the next 10 years, go from 500 to $5 billion. Uh, examples for that, there are a plenty. Thank uh, you, countries such as Norway or Australia. Norway nowadays exports as much as oil and gas related goods and services as they export oil and gas. And it's the same for, for Australia. Then there is huge potential, again, for, for integration, for particularly integrating the, the, the copper-related industries in, uh, in Peru and in Chile, and to develop uh, economies of scale for producing in the region these value-added uh, goods and, and, and services. And that is happening in spite of, of what is being said, but it is happening. And I, I think there is a huge potential in that regard as well for trade. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to shift, um, See? I, I want to leave the rest of this open to co conversation among everyone here. And I think before doing that, one of the, 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 the big changes that uh, everyone we've talked about as part of this panel is how is the political wind shifting in, in Mercosur, uh, in Argentina, in, in, in Brazil, 
um, and what that could mean for Mercosur and, and the Pacific Alliance. We, we touch on this in the, in the report as well about the potential for greater uh, uh, collaboration between, between the two blocks. And, and uh, Ambassador Valdez, I want to uh, start off with you. I mean, Chile has been, uh, uh, has been a long, long time an advocate for finding mechanisms for greater collaboration between, between the, two, the two blocks. Um, for you, and your, from your perspective, what, what, are the, what are the next steps or what do you see as the potential uh, given the shifts in, 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 in Mercosur countries for greater integration with the Mercosur bloc? Well, you've, you have a, you've probably underlined the most important one, uh, which is political change in uh, in some um, countries in the region. Um, the new Brazilian foreign minister Jose Serra, in his first speech uh, three or four days ago, uh, presented a series of guidelines to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on what Brazil had to do next. And the seventh guideline, uh, it talks about the reorganization of politics and economy in Argentina and in Brazil, he says, have to be accompanied by re a reorganization of Brazil's attitude to the rest of the region and to the integration of the rest of the region. And he says that a very important point is to promote and continue to build bridges instead of deepening differences in relation to the Pacific Alliance. He quotes Enrique Iglesias saying that we cannot remain impassive as we observe the renewal of a sort of Tordesillas Treaty which would deepen the separation between the East and the West of South American continent. This is extremely important because, of course, Brazil is a central, uh, a central uh, power in our region. Uh, the difficulties that Brazil is going through now uh, do not uh, indicate that these difficulties will remain for a long time. Brazil will come back, obviously, to its uh, very um, to, 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 to renew its influence and its power in the region. And the fact that um, a new perspective of the Pacific Alliance and of the relationship the, between the Atlantic Council and, and us in the Pacific could be, could, be, could be proposed, promoted, will completely change the logic of uh, the development in the region. My impression is that the efforts that Chile did, and I have to remember some, probably none of you said what I'm going to say, but I heard some friends here in the States saying that it was naive to try to promote an approach, uh, approchement, uh, between uh, the, the Pacific Alliance and the Mercosur. We definitely and, didn't say that they were uh, I, I know. But uh, I heard some other people in other places say that. And the point is that I have to confess that at that time, it, was, it sounded a bit uh, excessive to believe that countries were, that were following a very protectionist line would suddenly become fascinated with the four countries in the region that were had following an open society or open economy line. The point is that we have seen movements in Uruguay, we are seeing movements in Paraguay. Uh, Argentina has indicated uh, its interest in discussing uh, with uh, our four countries. We have organized seminars, discussions. In fact, um, if I'm not wrong, in something like two weeks? Last week, I'm sorry. During last week, there was a formal uh, meeting of vice ministers from the Pacific Alliance and Mercosur in, met in Lima to discuss the agenda. Um, uh, and uh, we are exchanging information, customs cooperation, sin single window and trade facilitation. Of course, we have differences. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have differences because our organizations were founded with different purposes. 
And therefore, we are not asking anybody to change its purposes, but we are trying to find all the elements which could lead us to cooperate in a better way um, in order to integrate better the region. This is, this is one of the points that, that we make, Sam, in the, in the report, is that this is really an opportunity, and, and this meeting last week shows that, to, to seize momentum with Mercosur, right? That we're, on this, we're, we're, we're seeing these winds of change and that this is really the, the moment to, to seize upon those. And we also agree with your assessment, too, that, that Brazil is going to come back. We, we remain, we're very bullish on Brazil's potential. I want to make sure that we broaden this conversation to everybody who's sitting around the table. Uh, so if you have uh, a comment, a question, uh, raise your hand. There'll be microphones that will be uh, passed around. Um, I want to bring in uh, our friend Antonio Morales down there first, who's from the Brazil Industries Coalition. Um, uh, to maybe, maybe Antonio, I'm not probably have a question, but also what, what's your perspective on, on on the changes in Brazil and what that can mean for the uh, better integration with the Pacific Alliance? Thank you, Jason. Um, yes, I think um, Ambassador Valdez was very clear and, and, and the overview uh, he mentioned reflects the, the current momentum we are uh, going through. So the interim government has a clear direction to a more uh, ambitious trade agenda. Um, from the point of view of the private sector, the links uh, between Brazil uh, and Latin America and, and also the Pacific region um, they continue to evolve in a very positive way. So um, even though Brazil was not engaged officially as a member of the, uh, of the alliance or of the TPP, uh, there were many agreements um, already working in the region. So uh, the, the Brazilian manufacturing sector benefits a lot of the exports to Latin America and all the preferential agreements that exist in Latin America. Um, but also uh, a lot of engagement and a lot of uh, investment is done uh, in terms of negotiating deep, the deepening uh, of this uh, integration uh, in specific agreements on government procurement with Chile, Peru, um, uh, Colombia, uh, trade facilitation, uh, investment rules, um, regulatory coherence and convergence with the United States, intellectual property with the United States, uh, uh, possible free trade agreement with Canada and, uh, and ongoing negotiation with Mexico for a uh, free trade agreement. So um, the country is already moving on and this uh, current agenda will gain speed uh, in, in this new government. And of course there is space for more cooperation uh, with the Pacific Alliance, but um, uh, Ambassador Valdez was right, there are differences and those differences actually they reflect uh, the type of economy that Brazil is. Uh, Brazil has a very plural uh, industry and diversified industry from aerospace to textile and it's not a one commodity country. So um, there are many provisions and many ways to engage the country in the international value chains and, and this will be uh, a part of this uh, negotiation. So Antonio, you, you share the ambassador's optimism about the potential for, for Brazil to enter. I'm sure, enter, enter, yeah. for sure, yes, yes. Uh, I saw my hand over here, if you could please um, identify, there'll be a microphone that will be circulating to you shortly. Uh, Nicolas is over here. If you could just say your name and uh, an organization before uh, your comment or question. Thank you, Randy Pistana, Florida International University. Uh, my question, and really it's more of a concern, we've been very optimistic about the Pacific Alliance and for good reason. Uh, my concern is really that rapid expansion oftentimes gets undermined by the bringing in of different actors and then you have the question of being politicized. So how can Pacific Alliance avoid falling into this trap of politicization? Uh, you saw it with Mercosur. How does Pacific Alliance prevent that? Ambassador, do you want to you respond to that? Yes. Um, my impression is that there, was, there were at the beginning of the Pacific Alliance certain indications that uh, in order to be, to be a member of the Pacific Alliance, you had to adhere to a certain uh, liberal code which was ideological. Uh, I wouldn't call ideology to follow uh, a path of respect to, for democracy or human rights or the rule of law or to believe uh, in an open economic system. But uh, if you want 
to use those concepts to confront the rest who does not belong to your coalition, then they become ide ideological. And I think that the Pacific Alliance has very intelligently uh, uh, separated itself from that sort of road or that sort of perspective. I don't see any danger of this happening, and I believe that Chile, and I'm proud of it, uh, was instrumental in reducing that possibility in the moment in which it proposed this discussion and uh, um, approximation. Um, yeah, approximation, I guess. Approximation. I always say it in French because it's easier. Yeah. Rapprochement. With, uh, the rest of the, with the rest of the region and particularly with the countries from the Mercosur. I think this is important because we, we will, of course, uh, if you look at the statements of some leaders of the Latin, some Latin American countries about uh, the Pacific Alliance, yesterday one president of Latin America was, continue, was continuing to insist that the Pacific Alliance was a terrible imperialist invention. Hmm. But of course, uh, you will always have that. You have to be indifferent to it. My impression is that uh, we have to continue with the same, same path because what we see is that we, are, we have more countries of Latin America interested now than they were interested at the beginning. Then that's a me measure of success. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Other, other questions? The others, we'll take both those questions together in the corner there. Okay. Uh, I'm, my name is Anna Dryden with STR Trade. Um, and my question is, what do you think is more likely, that the U.S. signs a free trade agreement with the Pacific Alliance or that Colombia joins the TPP? And additionally, for trade purposes, do you see any major differences between the Pacific Alliance and the TPP model? Okay. And we'll take the question next to you as well. Hi, Alejandro Sanchez, right for Jane's Defense Weekly now and then. Um, I'm also Peruvian, so I'm skeptical about uh, foreign blocks by default. Um, when we, we talk right now about the, uh, the Pacific Alliance of being the cool kid in the block, let's be honest. But if we're talking about this 10 years ago, we'll be talking about ALBA, how it was being successful when it once started. 20 years ago, it was Mercosur. That was going to be the future of, let, of South American integration. 30 years ago, I can make the case for the Andean community that will bring back to all the Andean countries together. So I guess that my question is a bit towards Samuel, too, that I understand the optimism towards the alliance, but isn't this like this kind of, we have, we've played this song before, don't we just have this type of blogs every decade, decade and a half, that start with a lot of hype, and then they get forgotten after you know, five, six years. Thank you. Do you want to actually, actually why don't, why don't, Stan, do you, do, you want, do you want to first respond, uh, bring you back in the conversation, uh, maybe about the optimism? Yeah, sure. I think that uh, it's a great point, and this is by no means a done deal. Take some of the you. Pumas Take some There's two elements. It's the advantage Thank you very much. opportunities, and there's no promise that you're going to be able to take advantage of the opportunities. And in fact, I think one of the vulnerabilities of the Pacific Alliance is that it, it's, at least initially, was very much driven by the presidents wanted it on the executive level. The presidents of these countries were actively involved and wanted to pursue it. And that's great on the one hand, because if your boss wants it to happen, it's more likely to happen. It's dangerous on the other hand, because the bosses change. And then remember there was the fear that perhaps President Bachelet was not going to be uh, as involved in the Pacific Alliance as her predecessor. That fear turned out to not be the case. Um, but I think it's to, to avoid this kind of flow, I think moving it beyond the presidential level, getting the buy-in from the private sector, getting the buy-in from the different ministries that are actively involved and maybe deeper than what will change when the presidents change is going to be key. And I think the question also expands back into your question, which is a really important one, and that is, on the one hand, the presidents of the given countries change, but what happens if you bring more countries in? And I think you heard a very optimistic and realistic uh, upside to it, but there are challenges. If you, you know, one thing we see some of these countries like Costa Rica has been half foot into joining, half foot out for a couple years now. Some other countries are in that boat too, like Panama. Now, a major aspect of the Pacific Alliance is accepting financial integration, but you see that's kind of a dangerous thing with Panama. Do you really want, as, as we've seen in some of the news lately? Similarly, a major aspect of the Pacific Alliance is uh, 
eliminating these visa restrictions, more free movement of people. And then you look at a country like Guatemala, well, that's a little bit dangerous uh, to, some, to a country like Colombia and Mexico, where that's a major pipeline of, of movement of illicit goods. Um, so I think that there's definitely the optimistic view of which I'm, I'm part of. But for this to be long lasting, I think on the one hand, it needs to be moved beyond presidential support, which I think it has. And on the other hand, you need to expand with great care. And if you do it, I mean, you see in the European Union what happens if you maybe expand a little bit too fast. So uh, people may disagree with me on that, but that's what I think. No, that's yours. No, I, 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 mean, I, think, I think that one, one of the things that we're talking about throughout this discussion is the importance of making this not a, a less and less a, a government-led or, or, or perceived by societies as a government-led initiative. This has to really be seen as a civil society and, and small and medium-sized business-led Led initiative as well. I think the other question, I'm going to take a little bit of the pressure off, off the Chilean ambassador from having to comment about Colombia uh, uh, joining the, uh, the, I think your, your, your scenario is where Colombia joining the TPP versus. Um, the TPP being approved. Versus the TPP being approved. Um, well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I, so I, you know, I'll, I'll speak for my, in my hat here of leading the Atlantic Council's uh, TPP work. I mean, I think that they're, um, you know, we see a lot of momentum on TPP approval in the individual member countries, uh, but of course the TPP will not go into effect if you don't have the U.S. and, and Japan uh, approving the agreement because you need 85% of the GDP of the countries to, uh, to be in approval of it. Uh, obviously, this is a very difficult issue on the, during a, a presidential year. The current line of thinking is that this would be, from the U.S. side, approved potentially during a lame duck session. But of course, the way that the Trade Promotion Authority legislation works is you can't. There's a lot of things that have to happen before the full Congress can vote on it. So this momentum would have to start. Would have to start earlier than just uh, after the uh, November election. I think as far as Colombia joining the TPP, I think that that. That if it gets ratified and the agreement grows, goes into effect, which which we hope uh, here from the Atlantic Council, um, that this that it'll be critical then for Colombia to uh, to dock on uh, to the agreement. This will be important for the I think for the Pacific Alliance overall because there will be a new set of regulatory rules and harmonization that come with the with the Pacific Alliance or sorry with the TPP. And at the same time, you'll have a number of Asian countries as well that have expressed interest um, in joining on to the uh, onto an eventual uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership as well. Um, I think we have time for one last question uh, because we like to always make sure that we leave on time. We might start a minute or two late, but we'd like to make sure we, we leave uh, exactly at two. If, is, there, is there any last burning question? If there isn't, I want to be sure to thank my colleague Maria Fernandez, Maria Fernanda Perez there with the, with, the, with, the, with the glasses who can raise, raise your hand here. Uh, Maria Fernanda has been an intricate member of the team putting together uh, the year-long consultations uh, and has uh, helped draft a number of sections of the report. I also want to thank a number of the people who are around the table who participated in, uh, in the discussions uh, over the course of the last year. Um, Rafael, uh, very helpful in participating in those discussions. Uh, uh, Rodrigo as well. Um, and a number of others that, that are around this table. So thank you very much to everybody. Of course, the ambassador and Ramon and, and the South Korean ambassador. But thank you all for your uh, uh, participation as part of this process and for uh, being here today. And hopefully this was interesting and, and helpful for you. So thanks again.